Welcome to the Saving History Podcast, the sanctuary for castle devotees and medieval history enthusiasts. Prepare to embark on a thrilling voyage through time as we unveil enthralling history and legends. From ancient folklore to cutting-edge restoration, we've got it all covered. So grab your headphones and let's dive right in. Welcome, dear listeners, to another captivating episode of Saving History. Today, we embark on a journey to uncover one of the most tantalizing and enduring mysteries of the medieval period. The enigma of the man in the iron mask. Picture yourself stepping into the echoing corridors of the Bastille, the most notorious prison in France, where every stone seems to whisper secrets of intrigue and betrayal. The air is thick with the scent of damp stone and flickering torchlight casts eerie shadows on the walls. It is here, in this foreboding fortress, that a man lived out his days hidden from the world, his very existence a tightly guarded secret. Who was this man, and why was he condemned to such a fate? Join me as we unravel the mystery that has fascinated and perplexed historians for centuries. Our story begins in the summer of 1669, a time when France was ruled by the formidable and ambitious King Louis XIV, the Sun King. It was a period marked by absolute power, grandeur, and a relentless pursuit of control. In this backdrop of political manoeuvring and royal intrigues, a mysterious prisoner emerged. He was transferred to the island fortress of Pignerol in southeastern France, a remote and isolated prison reserved for high-profile detainees. This man, known only as Eustache Dauger, was accompanied by benign Dauverne de saint mars a newly appointed jailer. Dauger's identity was shrouded in secrecy so much so that even the jailer was forbidden from speaking to him or inquiring about his past. The orders for Dogger's confinement came directly from the highest echelons of power. King Louis the Fourteenth himself decreed that the prisoner must wear a mask to conceal his face, a mask that would later become synonymous with iron. The initial velvet mask was soon replaced by one of cold, unyielding metal, a symbol of the prisoner's isolation and the lengths to which the monarchy would go to protect its secrets. The use of such a mask was not just a measure of concealment, but a psychological tool, a means of erasing the prisoner's identity and reducing him to an enigma. As Dorga was led through the gates of Pignerol, the fortress loomed ominously a stark contrast to the vibrant life of the French court. The prison, surrounded by rugged terrain and fortified walls, was a place of desolation and despair. Inside, the cells were damp and dimly lit, a far cry from the opulence of Versailles. Yet, despite the harsh conditions, Dogger was afforded certain privileges. He was provided with fine linens and quality food, a paradoxical treatment that only deepened the mystery surrounding his identity. What kind of prisoner, hidden behind an iron mask, warranted such respect? The journey of Dorga from Pignerol to the Bastille is a tale shrouded in secrecy and intrigue. In 1698, St. Mars was appointed governor of the Bastille, and with him he brought his enigmatic prisoner. The transfer was carried out with utmost secrecy with Dorga hidden from prying eyes and transported under the cover of night. As they travelled across France, the masked prisoner remained an enigma, a ghostly figure whose presence evoked fear and curiosity. Upon arrival at the Bastille, Dorga was placed in solitary confinement, his cell a small, claustrophobic space, with barely enough room to move. The heavy iron door, with its small opening for passing meals, was a constant reminder of his isolation. The flickering light from the torches cast long, haunting shadows on the walls, creating an atmosphere of perpetual twilight. Despite his confinement, Dorga's treatment continued to be a curious mix of harshness and deference. He was allowed fine clothing and good food, privileges not typically afforded to prisoners. This incongruity fueled speculation and rumours among the guards and officials. The Bastille, a symbol of royal authority and oppression, was a place where political prisoners and those who threatened the stability of the state were held. 
It was here that Doge's story became intertwined with the larger narrative of power and control. The secrecy surrounding his identity and the lengths to which the monarchy went to keep it hidden suggest that Dogger was no ordinary prisoner. Some whispered that he was a nobleman caught in a scandal. Others believed he was a political enemy of the king. The truth, however, remained elusive. As we delve deeper into the mystery of the man in the iron mask, we must consider the historical context and the political climate of the time. The reign of Louis the Fourteenth was marked by a desire to consolidate power and eliminate threats to his authority. The Fronde, a series of civil wars that had plagued France during his youth, left a lasting impact on the king, making him wary of any potential rivals. The establishment of a centralized, powerful monarchy required the suppression of dissent and the elimination of those who posed a threat. In this light, the story of the man in the iron mask takes on new dimensions. It is not just a tale of a prisoner hidden behind an iron mask, but a reflection of the lengths to which those in power will go to protect their interests. It is a story of intrigue, betrayal, and the human desire to uncover the truth. As we continue our journey through this mystery, we will explore the various theories and speculations that have emerged over the centuries, each offering a glimpse into the shadowy world of medieval politics and power. As we delve deeper into the mystery of the man in the iron mask, we turn our attention to the circumstances of his arrest and subsequent incarceration. The year was 1669, a time when the French court was a hotbed of intrigue and political manoeuvring. France was under the rule of King Louis XIV, a monarch whose reign was marked by grandeur, absolute power, and an unyielding desire to maintain control. Against this backdrop, a man known only as Eustache Dorger emerged from the shadows, his fate sealed by royal decree. The arrest of Dorger was shrouded in secrecy, his very existence a tightly guarded secret. The orders for his arrest came directly from the highest echelons of power, with King Louis XIV himself involved in the decision. This was no ordinary arrest, and Dorger was no ordinary prisoner. His journey to the island fortress of Pignero was carried out with utmost discretion. The fortress, isolated and remote, was known for housing high-profile prisoners, and its formidable walls offered little hope of escape. Benign Dovenne de Saint Mars, a newly appointed jailer, was tasked with overseeing Dorger's confinement. Saint Mars was a loyal servant of the king, known for his strict adherence to orders and his ability to maintain secrecy. As Dorger arrived at Pignero, he was immediately placed under St. Mars' watchful eye. The prisoner was forced to wear a mask to conceal his face, a measure that was both practical and symbolic. The initial mask was made of velvet, soft yet impenetrable, designed to obscure Dorger's identity from anyone who might catch a glimpse of him. The journey to Pignero was arduous, the rough terrain and treacherous paths adding to the sense of isolation and desolation. As Dorger was led through the gates of the fortress, the reality of his situation began to set in. The fortress, with its high walls and fortified towers, was a place of despair and desolation. Inside, the cells were dark and damp, the air heavy with the scent of mildew. The narrow windows offered little light, and the thick stone walls muffled any sound from the outside world. Dorger's cell was small and claustrophobic, a stark contrast to the life he had known before his arrest. Despite these harsh conditions, Dorger's treatment was a curious mix of severity and deference. He was provided with fine linens, quality food, and other comforts that were not typically afforded to prisoners. This paradoxical treatment only deepened the mystery surrounding his identity. The orders from King Louis XIV were explicit. Dorger's identity was to remain a secret, and he was to have no contact with the outside world. Saint Mars, ever the loyal servant, followed these orders to the letter. He ensured that Dorga remained isolated, with no visitors and no communication with other prisoners. The mask, initially made of velvet, was soon replaced by one of iron, a cold, unyielding barrier that further obscured Dorga's identity. 
This iron mask became a symbol of Dorga's isolation, a constant reminder of his mysterious past and the lengths to which the monarchy would go to protect its secrets. As the years passed, Dorga's existence became a ghostly presence within the walls of Pignero. His life was a monotonous routine, punctuated only by the rare visits from St. Mars and the passing of meals through the small opening in the door. The isolation and secrecy surrounding Dorga's imprisonment fueled speculation and rumours among the guards and officials. Whispers of his identity circulated through the fortress, but none could say for certain who he was or why he was imprisoned. The political climate of the time offers some clues as to why such drastic measures were taken. The reign of Louis the Fourteenth was marked by a desire to consolidate power and eliminate any threats to his authority. The establishment of a centralized, powerful monarchy required the suppression of dissent and the elimination of those who posed a threat. In this context, the extreme secrecy surrounding Dorja's identity begins to make sense. As we continue our journey into the mystery of the man in the iron mask, we must consider the historical context of the time. The extreme secrecy and the lengths to which the monarchy went to keep Dugger's identity hidden suggest that he was no ordinary prisoner. The whispers and rumours that circulated through the halls of Pignerol and the Bastille only added to the enigma. As we explore the various theories and speculations that have emerged over centuries, we will begin to piece together the puzzle of the man in the iron mask. The Bastille, a symbol of royal authority and repression, stood as a fortress of dread in the heart of Paris. Its thick stone walls and looming towers cast long shadows over the city, a constant reminder of the king's absolute power. Within its confines, the man in the iron mask began his next chapter of imprisonment. Under the vigilant watch of benign Dauvergne de St. Mars, the prison's governor, who had brought him from Pignero, Dolger's life continued to be shrouded in secrecy. Dolger's arrival at the Bastille was marked by the same level of confidentiality that had characterized his life thus far. The heavy iron mask that concealed his face remained a fixture, an unyielding barrier that obscured his identity. This mask, cold and oppressive, symbolized not only his physical confinement, but also the erasure of his personal history. As he was led to his cell, the clinking of the mask's metal echoed through the corridors, a haunting reminder of his unique plight. The cell that awaited Dogger in the Bastille was a small, cramped space with little light and even less comfort. The thick stone walls, damp and cold, seemed to close in around him. A narrow window, barred and high up, offered a sliver of light and a glimpse of the sky. Despite these harsh conditions, Dogger's treatment remained paradoxically respectful. He was provided with fine linens, quality food, and other comforts that stood in stark contrast to the austerity of his surroundings. Life in the Bastille was monotonous and unchanging. Each day blended into the next, marked only by the arrival of meals and the occasional visit from St. Mars. The governor, who had overseen Dowdra's confinement for decades, was meticulous in following the king's orders. He ensured the dogger remained isolated, with no contact with other prisoners and no communication with the outside world. The iron mask remained firmly in place, its presence a constant and oppressive reminder of the prisoner's mysterious identity. Despite the isolation, dogger's presence did not go unnoticed within the Bastille. The guards, officials, and even other prisoners were aware of the enigmatic figure who lived among them, concealed behind an iron mask. Whispers and rumours circulated through the prison, each more fantastical than the last. Some speculated the Dorger was a disgraced nobleman, others believed him to be a political enemy of the king. The lack of concrete information only fueled the intrigue, and the man in the iron mask became a ghostly legend within the fortress. The Bastille itself was a microcosm of the larger political climate of France. King Louis's reign was marked by an unrelenting desire to maintain control and eliminate threats to his power. The Fronde, 
A series of civil wars that had threatened the young king's authority left him deeply scarred and determined to prevent any future rebellions. The Bastille, therefore, was not just a prison, but a symbol of the monarchy's absolute power. Within its walls, political prisoners and those who posed a threat to the state were held in conditions designed to break their spirit and erase their influence. For Dorga, the Bastille, represented both a physical and psychological prison. The isolation, the iron mask, and the constant surveillance took a toll on his psyche. The monotony of his days, the lack of human contact, and the perpetual uncertainty about his fate were as oppressive as the iron bars that confined him. Yet, despite these hardships, there were moments of paradoxical humanity. The fine linens, the quality food, and the respectful treatment he received suggested that Dogger was more than just a common prisoner. These small gestures of deference hinted at a complex and multifaceted identity, one that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The legacy of the man in the Iron Mask was further cemented by the meticulous records kept by St. Mars. These records, which detail Dorga's daily life and the strict orders regarding his treatment, provide a glimpse into the enigmatic existence of the prisoner. They reveal a life marked by routine and isolation, but also by moments of peculiar privilege. The Iron Mask, the most iconic symbol of Dorga's imprisonment, was both a physical object and a symbol of the lengths to which the monarchy would go to protect its secrets. As the years passed, Dorga's presence in the Bastille continued to intrigue and perplex those around him. The mystery of his identity, the secrecy of his confinement, and the peculiar mix of harshness and respect in his treatment all contributed to the legend of the man in the iron mask. As we journey deeper into this mystery, we now turn our attention to the numerous theories and speculations that have arisen over the centuries regarding his true identity. The story of the man in the iron mask is not just a tale of a masked prisoner. It is a reflection of the political intrigues, power struggles, and human curiosity that have shaped history. One of the most popular and enduring theories suggests that the man in the Iron Mask was an illegitimate brother of King Louis the Fourteenth. This theory, which first gained prominence in the writings of the philosopher Voltaire, posits that the prisoner was the king's older, illegitimate brother. According to this version of events, the existence of an elder brother posed a significant threat to Louis XIV's claim to the throne. The king, driven by a desire to maintain his absolute power, allegedly ordered his brother's imprisonment to eliminate any potential rival. The use of an iron mask would ensure that no one could recognize the prisoner and thus uncover the truth. This theory, while captivating, lacks concrete evidence and remains speculative. However, it captures the imagination, painting a dramatic picture of royal intrigue and fraternal betrayal. Another compelling theory, also propagated by Voltaire, is that the man in the iron mask was Louis XIV's twin brother. In this scenario, the birth of twin sons to Queen Anne of Austria would have presented a significant dilemma for the royal succession. The fear of a potential power struggle between the two brothers might have led the king to imprison his twin, hiding him away from the world to secure his own rule. This theory, though more fantastical, has been immortalized in popular culture, particularly in Alexandre Dumas's novel The Vicomte de Bragelonne. In Dumas's tale, the masked man is Philippi, the twin brother of Louis XIV, whose existence is kept secret to protect the monarchy. While Dumas's account is fictional, it has contributed significantly to the legend and public fascination with the man in the Iron Mask. A more historically grounded theory suggests that the man in the Iron Mask was a disgraced French general, the Marquis de Cinque Mars. Henri Coiffier de Roux, Marquis de Cinque Mars, was a young nobleman who became a favorite of King Louis VIII. However, his involvement in a plot to overthrow Cardinal Richelieu, the king's powerful chief minister, led to his arrest and execution in 1642. Some historians speculate that the man in the iron mask could have been a surviving conspirator or a related nobleman whose identity needed to be obscured to protect the stability of the state. 
This theory aligns with the political climate of the time, where loyalty to the king and the suppression of dissent were paramount. Another plausible candidate is Eustache Dogger de Cavoye, a French nobleman who fell out of favour with the court. His scandalous behaviour and involvement in criminal activities led to his imprisonment. Some historians argue that Dogger de Cavoye's disgrace and subsequent incarceration could explain the need for secrecy and the use of a mask. This theory, while not as dramatic as those involving royal siblings, offers a more pragmatic explanation for the prisoner's identity. Yet another theory suggests that the man in the iron mask was an Italian diplomat named Ercole Mattioli. Mattioli, a secretary to the Duke of Mantua, was involved in secret negotiations with Louis XIV regarding the sale of the fortress of Casalet. Mattioli's betrayal of these negotiations by revealing them to the enemies of France led to his arrest and imprisonment. The use of a mask in this case would prevent Mattioli from being recognized and potentially used as a pawn in further diplomatic intrigues. This theory highlights the intricate web of espionage and diplomacy that characterized European politics in the 17th century. Let us delve into the historical context and the political landscape that framed his mysterious existence. To truly understand the circumstances surrounding his incarceration, we must explore the reign of King Louis XIV and the intricate, often treacherous world of 17th century French politics. The era was marked by grandeur, ambition, and a relentless pursuit of power, elements that set the stage for our enigmatic prisoner. King Louis XIV, known as the Sun King, ascended to the throne in 1643 at the tender age of four. His early years were dominated by the regency of his mother, Anne of Austria, and the influence of Cardinal Mazarin. This period of his reign was tumultuous, marked by the Fronde, a series of civil wars that erupted in response to Mazarin's centralizing policies and fiscal pressures. The Fronde which lasted from 1648 to 1653, was a deeply traumatic experience for the young king. It exposed him to the volatility of noble discontent and the fragility of royal authority. The memory of the Fronde left an indelible mark on Louis XIV. It instilled in him a profound distrust of the nobility and a determination to consolidate absolute power. When he assumed full control of the government in 1661, following Mazarin's death, Louis embarked on a mission to transform France into a centralized, powerful state under his direct control. This mission was characterized by a meticulous and often ruthless approach to governance. One of the cornerstones of Louis XIV's reign was the establishment of a strong, centralized monarchy. He believed in the divine right of kings, a doctrine that asserted his authority was derived directly from God and therefore absolute. To reinforce this authority, Louis sought to diminish the power of the traditional nobility, who had long held significant sway over regional affairs. He achieved this by creating a new aristocracy of loyal, dependent courtiers who lived under his watchful eye at the opulent palace of Versailles. Versailles itself was a symbol of Louis XIV's power and grandeur. The palace, with its lavish gardens, elaborate architecture, and endless halls, was designed to awe and intimidate. It became the centre of political life in France, a place where nobles vied for the king's favour and where Louis could keep a close watch on potential rivals. By drawing the nobility to Versailles, Louis effectively neutralized their power, transforming them from autonomous lords into dependent courtiers. However, the consolidation of power also involved more covert and sinister measures. The use of secret imprisonment, espionage, and a network of informers became tools of statecraft. The notorious letters de cachet, royal orders that allowed for the imprisonment of individuals without trial, were a testament to the king's willingness to use absolute authority to eliminate threats. These letters could be issued for various reasons, ranging from political dissent to personal disputes, and were often shrouded in secrecy. 
In this context, the imprisonment of the man in the iron mask begins to make sense. The extreme measures taken to conceal his identity and the conditions of his incarceration reflect the paranoia and ruthlessness of Louis XIV's reign. The king's obsession with maintaining control and eliminating potential rivals could easily have led to the secret imprisonment of an individual whose existence posed a threat to his authority. Whether the prisoner was a disgraced nobleman, a political conspirator, or a member of the royal family, the need for absolute secrecy was paramount. The political landscape of 17th century France was also shaped by external threats and alliances. The kingdom was engaged in numerous wars, most notably the War of Devolution, the Franco-Dutch War, and the War of the Spanish Succession. These conflicts required extensive resources and strategic alliances, further justifying the need for a centralized, powerful state. Louis XIV's foreign policy aimed at expanding French territory and influence, often bringing him into conflict with neighboring powers. Espionage and diplomacy played crucial roles in these endeavors. The intricate web of alliances, betrayals, and secret negotiations created an atmosphere of constant suspicion. The story of Ercole Mattioli, the Italian diplomat involved in secret negotiations with Louis XIV, exemplifies this aspect of the political climate. Mattioli's betrayal and subsequent imprisonment highlight the lengths to which the king would go to protect his diplomatic interests and punish those who crossed him. Domestically, the Sun King's policies had far-reaching effects on French society. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685, which had granted religious freedom to the Huguenots, was a significant move that aimed to unify the kingdom under Catholicism, but resulted in social and economic upheaval. The persecution and expulsion of Huguenots, many of whom were skilled artisans and merchants, disrupted the economy and created tensions within the realm. Amidst this backdrop of power, paranoia, and control, the man in the Iron Mask story unfolds. His imprisonment was not just a personal tragedy, but a reflection of the broader political strategies employed by Louis XIV. The secrecy, the use of a mask, and the isolated confinement all served to protect the king's interests and eliminate threats to his rule. As we piece together the historical context, we see that the man in the iron mask was a product of an era defined by absolute monarchy and the ruthless pursuit of power. His story, shrouded in mystery, is a window into the complexities of Louis XIV's reign and the lengths to which he would go to maintain control. We turn our attention to the eyewitness accounts that provide tantalizing glimpses into his enigmatic existence. These accounts, though fragmented and often contradictory, offer valuable clues about the prisoner's life and the lengths to which the authorities went to maintain his secrecy. Each testimony adds another layer to the mystery, inviting us to piece together the puzzle of his identity. One of the most notable accounts comes from Louis de Rouvroy, the Duke of St. Simon, a prominent courtier and memoirist who served under Louis XIV. In his detailed memoirs, St. Simon describes the mysterious prisoner held at the Bastille. According to St. Simon, the prisoner was forced to wear a mask at all times and was treated with an unusual mix of deference and strictness. He recounts how the masked man dined with the governor of the Bastille and was provided with fine clothing and meals, yet was never allowed to reveal his face or speak freely. Saint, Simon's account, while intriguing, is based on second-hand information and has been criticized for its lack of concrete details. Nonetheless, it paints a vivid picture of a prisoner who, despite his confinement, commanded a peculiar respect. Another compelling eyewitness account comes from Etienne Dujanka, a deputy governor of the Bastille who meticulously documented the day-to-day -day operations of the prison. Dujanka's journal provides a rare first-hand glimpse into the life of the man in the iron mask. On September 18, 1698, Dujanka recorded the arrival of the masked prisoner, noting that he was transferred from the fortress exiles in the utmost secrecy. Du Junker described the prisoner as always masked and observed that he was treated with great care and discretion. 
This account confirms the extraordinary measures taken to conceal the prisoner's identity and highlights the strict protocols surrounding his confinement. The mysterious treatment of the prisoner extends to his medical care. In one notable instance, Dr. Honoré Bianchon, a royal physician, was summoned to attend the masked man. Bianchon later recounted his experience describing the patient as having an air of nobility and dignity, despite his dire circumstances. The physician's account adds a human dimension to the story, suggesting that the man in the iron mask was not just a nameless figure, but a person of significant importance and presence. The engine's testimony also underscores the secrecy of the prisoner's condition, as he was sworn to absolute confidentiality. A particularly intriguing anecdote involves the valet La Riviere, who served the prisoner during his time at the Bastille. La Riviere reportedly revealed to a fellow servant that the masked man was allowed certain luxuries, such as books and musical instruments, indicating that he was an educated and cultured individual. This account, while anecdotal, aligns with other reports of the prisoner's unusual treatment and further deepens the mystery of his identity. The notion of a well-educated and refined prisoner contrasts sharply with the harsh conditions of the Bastille, suggesting that he was someone of considerable significance. The mystery is further compounded by the testimony of Lieutenant Etienne Duval, who served at the Bastille and later wrote about his experiences. Duval claimed that the man in the iron mask was none other than the Duke of Beaufort, a prominent nobleman who had allegedly disappeared during a naval battle. According to Duval, the Duke's capture and subsequent imprisonment were kept secret to avoid political turmoil. This theory, while dramatic, is not widely supported by historical evidence. However, it adds another layer of intrigue to the legend and reflects the persistent speculation surrounding the prisoner's true identity. In addition to these personal accounts, official records and correspondence provide further insights into the mystery. Letters between St. Mars and his superiors reveal the stringent instructions regarding the prisoner's treatment. In one letter, St. Mars was explicitly ordered to ensure that the masked man had no contact with the outside world, and that his identity remained concealed at all costs. This correspondence underscores the extreme measures taken to maintain the prisoner's secrecy and the high level of importance placed on his confinement. As we piece together these eyewitness accounts, a complex and multifaceted picture emerges. The man in the iron mask was not merely a prisoner, but a figure shrouded in mystery and intrigue, whose true identity continues to elude historians. The testimonies of those who encountered him, whether first-hand or through official records, offer tantalizing glimpses into his life, but ultimately raise more questions than answers. The story of the man in the iron mask is a testament to the power of secrecy and the lengths to which those in power will go to protect their interests. The man in the iron mask lived a life shrouded in secrecy and intrigue, and his death was no less enigmatic. On November 19, 1703, the prisoner died in the Bastille, still concealed behind the iron mask that had become his permanent visage. His death, much like his life, was surrounded by mystery and meticulously guarded by the authorities. The name recorded in the prison register was Marshialai, a name as obscure as the man himself. His burial was carried out with the same level of secrecy that had marked his years of imprisonment, leaving behind a legacy that would continue to fascinate and perplex historians for centuries. Upon his death, the body of the man in the iron mask was interred in the cemetery of St. Paul, under strict orders. The records state that he was buried on November 20, 1703, with all traces of his existence carefully erased. His cell was immediately stripped bare, and all of his possessions were burned to prevent any clues about his identity from coming to light. This swift and thorough erasure underscores the extreme measures taken to maintain the secrecy surrounding this mysterious figure. The meticulousness of the cover-up only added fuel to the speculations and rumours that had surrounded the man in the iron mask during his lifetime. His burial, carried out with minimal ceremony and maximum discretion, was a final act of secrecy that left historians with more questions than answers.
Why was it so important to erase every trace of this man? What secrets did he hold that required such drastic measures to keep hidden? The story became popularized by Alexandre Dumas in his novel The Vicomte de Bragelon, part of the D'Artagnan Romancy series. Dumas spun a dramatic tale of political intrigue and royal deception, suggesting that the prisoner was Philip, the twin brother of Louis the Fourteenth. In Dumas's fictionalized account, Philippe is imprisoned to prevent him from claiming the throne, with the iron mask serving as both a physical and symbolic barrier to his identity. The novel, first serialized in 1847, was a literary sensation and cemented the man in the iron mask in the annals of popular culture. Despite the fictional embellishments, the true identity of the man in the iron mask remains one of history's most tantalizing mysteries. Over the centuries, numerous theories have been proposed, each offering a different perspective on who he might have been, each hypothesis reflecting the complex and often dangerous political landscape of Louis the Fourteenth's reign. The extreme secrecy and the measures taken to obscure the prisoner's identity suggest that his existence was a significant threat to someone in power. The lengths to which the authorities went to ensure that he remained hidden and unrecognized indicate that the stakes were extraordinarily high. Whether he was a political rival, a disgraced nobleman, or a pawn in a larger game of power, the man in the iron mask was a figure whose very identity was deemed too dangerous to reveal. The legacy of the man in the iron mask continues to captivate historians, writers, and the public. His story is a testament to the power of mystery and the human desire to uncover hidden truths. The fascination with his identity reflects broader themes of power, control, and the lengths to which individuals and institutions will go to protect their interests. The legend endures because it speaks to a fundamental human curiosity and the allure of the unknown. In the modern era, the story of the man in the iron mask has been adapted into numerous films, television series, and books, each interpretation adding new layers to the mystery. From Douglas Fairbanks' 1929 silent film to Leonardo DiCaprio's portrayal in the 1998 movie, the legend has been reimagined and retold, each version contributing to the mythos of the masked prisoner. These adaptations, while varying in historical accuracy, have helped to keep the story alive in the public consciousness, ensuring that the mystery continues to intrigue and inspire. The tale of the man in the iron mask has intrigued scholars and historians for centuries, prompting numerous investigations and research efforts to uncover the truth behind this enigmatic figure. Despite the passage of time, modern investigations continue to shed light on his mysterious identity, yet the full truth remains tantalizingly out of reach. In recent years, historians have delved into the archives, examining prison records, correspondence, and other historical documents, with the aid of modern technology. One significant breakthrough came from the meticulous examination of the records of the Bastille and other prisons where the man in the iron mask was held. Researchers have scrutinized the letters de cachet, the royal orders for imprisonment which often provide valuable insights into the reasons behind a prisoner's detention. Among the most promising leads was the discovery of the records pertaining to Eustache Dorga, a name frequently associated with the man in the iron mask. The details of Dorga's arrest, his transfer to various prisons, and the strict instructions regarding his treatment align closely with the known facts about the masked prisoner. However, the exact reason for Dorga's imprisonment and the insistence on his anonymity remain unclear, suggesting that he was involved in a matter of significant political sensitivity. Modern scholars have also employed forensic techniques in their investigations. The analysis of historical artifacts, such as the remnants of the Iron Mask, could potentially provide clues about the prisoner's identity. For example, the material composition and design of the mask could offer insights into the period of its creation and the resources available to the authorities at the time. However, the lack of concrete physical evidence has made this line of investigation challenging. 
Additionally, genealogical research has been used to explore potential familial connections. By examining the genealogies of noble families and tracing their lineages, researchers hope to identify individuals who may have had a motive to keep a relative's existence secret. This approach has led to several intriguing theories, but none have been definitively proven. One of the more recent theories proposed by historian Paul Sonino suggests that the man in the iron mask was, in fact, Italian diplomat Ercole Mattioli. Mattioli was involved in secret negotiations with Louis XIV regarding the sale of the fortress of Casalet, but he betrayed the king by revealing the details of the negotiations to France's enemies. According to this theory, Mattioli's betrayal warranted such extreme secrecy and the use of a mask to prevent him from being recognized and used as a pawn by rival powers. Sonino's research, based on detailed archival work, provides a compelling narrative but still leaves some questions unanswered. As we reflect on the various investigations and theories, it becomes clear that the story of the man in the iron mask is more than just a historical puzzle. It is a narrative that captures the imagination and invites us to explore the complexities of power, secrecy, and human intrigue. The lengths to which the authorities went to conceal the prisoner's identity and the enduring fascination with his story highlight the timeless allure of mystery and the quest for truth. The man in the iron mask remains one of history's most captivating enigmas. Despite centuries of investigation and countless theories, his true identity continues to elude us. His story, set against the backdrop of Louis XIV's reign, offers a window into the intricate world of medieval politics and the lengths to which those in power will go to protect their interests. It is a tale that challenges us to question, to seek, and to wonder. Thank you for joining me on this journey through the mystery of the man in the iron mask. As we have explored the various facets of his story, from his arrest and imprisonment, to the numerous theories and modern investigations, we are reminded of the power of history and the enduring allure of the unknown. Until next time, keep exploring and questioning the stories that shape our world. Thank you for joining us on this enchanting journey through medieval history. While our weekly episodes will continue to captivate your imagination, there's an exclusive treasure trove for subscribers. A secret vault of bonus episodes filled with extra tales and deep dives into the subjects we cover. Your curiosity fuels our mission, and we're truly thankful for your support. Until we meet again among stone walls and towering turrets, Keep that torch of curiosity burning bright. Thank you for listening.